Hi everyone and welcome to How Good's Footy in Asia, AFL Asia's official podcast. I'm your co-host Matty Gale based in Osaka, Japan. Uh, joining me is our other co-host over in Saigon, Vietnam, Billy Bang Bang Krang. How are you Bill? Yeah, not bad Matty. All good over here. Thank you uh, very shortly but today's special guest, um, he's got a fairly good CV and a fairly good footy CV to match it. Um, we've got uh, a Hong Kong life member, uh, coach, player. Um, Club legend. Bing Tang's coach, <laughs> player, committee member, uh, the founder of the Guangzhou Scorpions, and, and more importantly, the founder of the Southern China AFL in one big grant. Dooley Dolls, thanks for joining us for episode 12 of How Good City in Asia. Mate, if we're talking footy, you got to call me Tom, you know that, don't you? I don't, the, the grant guy doesn't exist around a footy club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, uh, I was just doing some um, research yesterday and I come across a a farewell banner for um, to kill <laughs> Tom Dooley back yeah. in 2007. So I'm sure that, that story will pop up later in the day. But um, firstly, how's the weather in Singapore? Oh, not too bad, mate. It's um, it's 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 groundhog day every day. You know, in in summer it's uh, 33, in winter it's 32. So it's uh, it's all good. I'm just at home now. We're still in um, we're still in a you know working sh- you know split teams and stuff. So. Hence, I was able to get up some of my old shirts out to um, – I didn't want gloves, you know, wearing scorpions. So I had to hang up the, the Jakarta shirts and the dragon shirts and the volcano shirts. So, you know, there you go. Keep everyone happy. Yeah, done well there. Um, 37 degrees in Osaka. I was speaking to uh, Simon Whitfield uh, – Simon, Simon Whitfield – Simon Highfield, our AFL Asia development manager, a um, short time ago, and 15 and bucketing down in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and I read today that there was uh, – a Hong Kong Dragons female player starting a new job but working from home because there's a uh, a typhoon going through Hong Kong as we speak. So, oh, well, there you yeah, go. interesting weather, interesting times. How's things over your way, Bill? Um, yeah, it's been pretty good since I think a couple of weeks ago when I was a bit worried about, you know, potential flare-up. They've um, jumped back on top of it again. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, um, everything's been kept to the, the central areas where it was. Saigon hasn't had a case in three weeks. It's incredible. So we feel pretty confident again. Yep. Streets are manic. Everyone's, everyone's back into the groove. Yeah, right. We had our lowest case um, wow. one day on Monday down to 71. So it's been probably two or three weeks of triple figures up to I think even 240 was our max, but they've shut down that Shinsubashi nightlife area, which... Uh, would have taken the big G tour, but uh, hoping they can get it down because, um, you know, we got down to as low as 24 and now we're up to 1800. So, Ooh, uh, the government's put some a lot of band aid effects in place to keep the GDP going, but um, yeah, it's it's not very good. And hoping there's some changes shortly. Dills, how long have you been working at home from home? Oh, it's been largely on well, we're at home lockdown, we got locked down pretty badly in the uh, March, April, uh, May, but since June, it's been split teams, you know, you go in the office one week and spend the other week at home. Um, but we're pretty good here at the moment. I think numbers, they that big issue with the dormitories, but they've largely been solved. So the numbers are really in the, are more in the tens, not the hundreds anymore, or the thousands like they were, you know, a couple of months ago. And even to the point where we can go down the muddies, uh, the Irish pub down here and watch the footy on our laptop over a beer with, with groups of five. So, um, so it's, it's, you know, these are little things you don't, I suppose you, you take for granted when you're in, you know, this type of situation to, to go to the pub and, and have a beer to watch the footy. So, you know, it's made life a little bit more more bearable. Yeah, we might have just actually confuse some of our viewers today. So you're actually based in Singapore. Um, you yeah. live in Hong Kong, uh, Guangzhou, Shanghai, um, Jakarta, and now in Singapore. So we'll touch base on all the chapters in the, in the book, which is Tom Grant Dooley. But... To get us underway, Bill, I'll let you fire up the engine for question number one. Yeah, okay, Dules. Um, can you take us right back? Uh, tell us a little bit about your growing up, your your footy involvement and, and general life around those times. Yeah, look, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I kind of uh, grew, grew, I grew up in Williamstown. Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Altona North, the probably less liberious part of Williamstown. Um, <laughs> And I uh, played my junior, junior footy at, at the Cotswood, uh, the wood, which is right as you come off the Westgate Bridge, the uh, oval down there. Um, I played over 100, 100 games of junior footy at Spotty and uh, loved it. Um, but I suppose 
the other influence footy wise was was Williamstown Footy Club, who I've been actively involved with uh, all my life, and uh, now is led by my parents. Um, my mum, she's had to stop obviously no footy this year, so she's not working the kiosk this year. But uh, right. sixty five consecutive seasons operating the kiosk down at Jelly Brand, um, rain, right. hail, snow, or shine. So mum um, was totally committed to the club, and, and my dad was club secretary. They they kind of met around the footy club. Uh, famously got married on the day they won the grand final and had uh, the premiership cup at the reception, all that type of stuff. Uh, so, so I very much, yeah, Williamstown Footy Club was uh, the blue and gold was very much in my veins. And and, um, and I, when I was back in Melbourne uh, for four or five years, just recently I was able to go on the board and, and be involved in a, in a very well run and, and, a, and a great historical footy club. Oh, I should think we'll... The only thing I should add is that I, I joined the Navy at 16, so I stopped playing footy at Spotty and, and joined the Navy at 16. So, um, so I went across West and then just played in the Navy 16 years. I played a lot of footy in the Navy, um, you know, whether it be into service. Um, I'm, I'm a life member of the Hunterman Hogs Football Club in Canberra, so way too many clubs. Like many people, this club I've been involved in as president, um, ran the committee there, coached. Played a shitload of games and um, was yeah, made a life member of the Hunter Hogs. So another another problem. Pretty proud of. Yeah. Okay. It threw me off a little bit because um, a quick look through LinkedIn. It's most of the the uh, Asian sort of work history. Had me thinking that you would have had the the typical corporate ladder at the Australian end. So my next question was, how did your Australian uh, professional build up end up leading you to Asia? But how did that that Navy time end up connecting you to heading to Asia? Yeah, so, um, so I, I, I joined the Navy as a 16 year old as a radio operator. We had very able skills in the But more importantly, I was on a ship that went to Shanghai in 1986, um, HMO Sternwich. And uh, as you can imagine, Shanghai in 86 was everyone wore, you know, wearing uh, mouse suits and white shirts, and, and it was basically not much going on, um, still coming out of, uh, you know, it's a the post-culture revolution area. But I fell in love with things Chinese in that visit. I met a guy in the street, had a bit of newspaper. It was written in Chinese about the ship visit. I, I took it and I thought one day I'm going to read this. And um, so I came back from um, being on that ship and went to Canberra, put myself through night school, learned to speak Chinese, um, was then picked up as a Chinese linguist in the Navy. So the Navy then uh, gave me professional training to be a Chinese linguist. And that's how I ended up in Hong Kong. I was actually posted to Hong Kong in 91 um, as a sailor to work for the British forces in Hong Kong as a Chinese translator interpreter um, at, based out of um, Tamar, the main base there. And that's how I met the Hong Kong Dragons and the guys have been mate, yeah, my mates uh, ever since. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, Normal career progression to be a funds manager like I am now, I know. I was going to say, you still haven't really linked me into the... The, the LinkedIn stuff that that um that I did pre pre this um so how did how did that how did you establish establish yourself uh, from a professional perspective in Asia and then tell us a little bit about your your pathway from from then yeah so I, I got to Hong Kong as a and I was a Chinese linguist and I loved being in Asia and uh, I started thinking how do I stay here and um, in the Navy you kind of got to go back and go to sea all the time so um I. Again, went to night school while I was in Hong Kong. In those days, it was the old um, the mail order, you know, I, as the University of New England in Armadale. They accepted me as a mature age student. And um, so I started doing a Bachelor of Asian Studies um, and then was commissioned as an officer in the Navy at the end of my time in Hong Kong. And the Navy then sent me to ANU to finish my studies where I got my degree in Asian Studies, um, majoring in Mandarin. Became an officer in the Navy. And uh, while I was doing that, um, I was thinking about, you know, other options and, and the, basically there's an advert in the local press for a Chinese linguist to join foreign affairs as a China specialist. So I applied and uh, blow me down, was accepted. Um, so I flipped from the Navy into foreign affairs as a Chinese specialist in 98 um, and became a, uh, yeah, became a DFAT person, a foreign affairs diplomat, um, and then got posted to Shanghai in the consulate. Um, then came back, worked in the China area a fair bit but was then sent to Jakarta. Actually, my wife was uh, was posted to Jakarta and I followed her. I met her in the Navy. She was my, my last boss in the Navy. That's how we met. Still is the boss. Nothing really has changed there at all. <laughs> um, and I followed her to Jakarta. So I met the, you know, Butangs, um, 
and basically came back, went back in the China area, um, did well in the China area and was then appointed um, as the Consul General for Australia in Guangzhou, which is what took me back to Guangzhou um, as the Consul General. I've got, I'm not sure who's on the call, but a couple of my mates in Hong Kong at the time who had been there when I was a sailor, one of the rights of the uh, foreign minister query the decision of putting me as consul general to represent Australia's interest in southern China, given my track record in Hong Kong in the day. But, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I didn't just express myself too much um, in Guangzhou. And, and when I was in there, I was looking at what to do next. And um, I got asked if I want to come and join a fund management company to go into, into the private sector to set up their Asia business, um, a couple called Hastings Funds Management. And I did a speech about capital flows out of China into Australia. And it was right at that point when Chinese money was going into the different markets in Australia. And um, so I, I left the world of diplomacy to become a funds manager. <laughs> and uh, I, I like to joke that I've got year 10 mathematics, some of the best, you know, most illiterate finance guy going around possibly. But um, <laughs> so I did quite a while with uh, Hastings um, business. We raised a lot of capital for their funds and and then when Hastings was sold, ARA here in Singapore, who I'd met a few of the guys, they wanted to move into infrastructure funds management. So John Lim, who's the the, uh, the founder and owner of ARA, one of Singapore's richest guys, um, reached out to me and asked me to come and become the CEO of his new funds management platform here. I know it's totally not where, you'd, not where I thought I'd end up when I started uh, going to China in 1986. <laughs> Uh, that's unbelievable, Dawes. Um, yeah. Bill, the, that cafe must be pretty busy today. They're, cook, they're notching up a few coffees while we're, uh, we're on call. I swear <laughs> to God, they they just saved their grinding till I walk in. It's been pretty quiet there the last few weeks, so it's good to see them busy, but the weather looks much better than what it was um, the previous couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Dawes, before we touch base on the whole footy experience, um, you've lived in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Jakarta, and now Singapore. Can you give us the pros and cons of these different cities? Let's face it, they're, they're all completely different in, in their own individual role. What's the pros and cons? What's your favourite city? Yeah, well, that's a little hard one, actually. I, I do get asked that. Um, I have a real big soft spot for Hong Kong, given that I was a young lad. I arrived there when I was 20, 24 and left when I was 31. Um, so Hong Kong will forever be a big part of my life. Um, but that being said, you know, I've, I've loved every city I've been in. Um, I just love the cultural interaction. So um, Jakarta had its challenges given uh, the pollution and, and when I was there, the security issue. So that was quite a um, quite a you know, big issue at the time. And uh, But they just made the, the Bintangs such a close bunch of guys. You know, it's probably some of the closest bunch of guys I've ever met in my life playing footy. Um, and Jakarta itself, while it's, it can be a very big, the big jury and big smelly place, once you get out of uh, Jakarta, Indonesia is absolutely a most amazing country, and I love travelling around Indonesia. And I had a great job at the embassy, which took me around the archipelago. So I, you know, loved, loved Indonesia. Um, China, I mean, I'm a Chinese linguist. I love the history. So to live in Guangzhou, Shanghai, and I spent a little bit of time in Beijing, and I've travelled all around China. Um, as, as Consul General, I looked after southern China, so I got to travel to, you know, to Lijiang and to Yunnan and Kunming and Hainan Island and uh, use my Chinese, and, and I backpacked around China. So... Yeah, I love them all because they're all so different. Yeah, that's probably the the answer. Yeah, and Singapore. I mean, I, Singapore is very different again. Um, but at this stage of my life, which means the backpacking's way out the door, and I need more the the uh, the, the, the lovely comfort of life these days. Cold beer in a fridge, good wine. Yeah, Singapore's perfect. So, yeah. And it sounds like you've moved with your age um, as you've gone along, and it's worked. Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I've noticed that you got rid of the fluff on the face, so um, you're definitely back in work mode. Um, just one more thing. We might have some Chinese listeners out there. Can you just put a little bit of Chinese together? Because I'm, 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 my Japanese is hopeless. So I don't know what Bill's Vietnamese is like, but I've always had this dream that one day I'll wake up and I'll start speaking Japanese, and it's just not <laughs> to happen. But can you just give us something um, to welcome all the Chinese viewers, please? Yeah, 欢迎我的中国的朋友在中国听我的这个讲话。谢谢，谢谢，谢谢啊。<laughs> I just said yeah. thanks for listening to what I'm about to say. Thank you very much. Yep. Brilliant. No, I really appreciate it because there's not a lot of that um, interaction. I, I often hear Kero talking small talk in, in Vietnamese and he gets away with it. And mine gets a bit better after a few beers, but uh, not yeah. that. Um, that's just super impressive. So well done. 
Um, now, you're a life member of the Hong Kong Dragons. You said you, you probably spent some of your best years, and, and as a footballer, 24 to 31, around that age group is um, pretty prime time as a footballer. Did you have much success with uh, the Hong Kong Dragons? And I, I heard just before that you you were involved in one of the first ever tours of any club in Asian footy. Can you take us back to those times way back when in 1986? Yeah, it was it was it was uh, it was one of those things where I just played a year of footy in Canberra um, for, for the Hogs and and uh, had a really good year, you know, got finished in the top three I think in the league, whatever. And, and um, so I was at my you know 23, 24, really raring to go, and there I am in Hong Kong. And uh, so I didn't even bring any footy boots with me, thinking there was not going to be any footy in Hong Kong. And um, and arrived and probably got told by my boss that there's a a game happening in about three weeks down at um, down at Stanley Fort. I think it was Stanley Fort. Yeah, I think it was Stanley Ford. And uh, so I went down to training at Soakham Po and, um, and Ray Wood, who to this day is still a very good friend of mine. I was on the phone with him yesterday, big fan of footy in Asia. Um, he you know, basically came over and said, you know, join in and um, the, the boys made me feel really well at home. And, and in those days, we literally were playing exhibition games. So it was a one-off. You didn't have – you played amongst yourselves. You know, it, was, it wasn't like it is now. So we, we played this game out at uh, Stanley um, and then – I think we realised we enjoyed that much. We thought who else in the region um, is playing footy. We heard about the Goanas in uh, Tokyo. So um, in March 92, we put together a team and went over and played the, um, I think we wore the Brisbane Bears jumpers. Uh, that we, because when we, when we wrote to the AFL to get jumpers for the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Dragons footy jumper, they sent us a set of Norwood jumpers and a set of Brisbane Bears jumpers. Um, so I think the Brisbane Bears had one tour and that was to, uh, to, to Tokyo to play against the Goannas. And I think we promptly ditched them after that and decided that Nord was it. <laughs> uh, um, what do, there was an Asian chance back then, was there? Nah, there was, there was just literally, I think clubs, Singapore had a club, I think, at that point. Um, and I know that Bintang started in 95, so clubs were just starting to appear. But largely we played games amongst ourselves or we played one game a year, which is a big exhibition game. And in uh, the following year, 92, I mean, there's one of the highlights still of uh, you know, my footy. We, we played in front of 3,000 people at, um, at Stanley Fort. We had a, a, a helicopter come across the fort with a flag and, and drop the football onto the ground. You know, uh, because I was attached to the British military, I could pull a few strings to get, a, to get, the, to get the ground and a few other things. Um, but, yeah, 3,000 people to watch Victoria take on the rest of the world. It was that we all had a big – all the Victorians were wearing a big V. Um, yeah. I've got a good feel of that, actually, and uh, – yeah, it was just an awesome, awesome experience. And I think then after that, footy in Asia started to really take off. I reckon that tradition's still going today, Dawes, because I remember the last couple of years that they've played um, SA versus Victoria, or basically still Victoria versus the rest. And uh, the Hong Kong Dragons continue on your tradition. I don't think they're getting the crowds of 3,000 people <laughs> or they're getting the, the balls de delivered out of a helicopter in the sky. But no, nah, it's, it's fantastic to see that that tradition has continued um, indirectly or directly as a result of your involvement. Let's move along to the Jakarta Bintangs. Um, you moved there when that was pretty much in its infancy as well. Um, what was it like being involved with it? Like you're in the involved with probably the, it is the biggest club or in the top two biggest clubs in Asia. Then you've gone to the Jakarta Bintangs. You mentioned about security issues at the time. Let's take us back to the Jakarta Bintangs and your involvement there. Yeah. Um Actually, the, as you were talking, I was starting to think, when did I first actually meet the guys? And uh, so I arrived in, um, I arrived in, uh, must have been February or March 2004, and um, and I'd done my bit of Googling, and there was a club in uh, in Jakarta, so I went down to training. I think as my wife's posting, so I didn't have a job or anything. I thought, you beauty, I can, uh, you know, practice the golf swing and, um, and do all those things I've, I've always wanted to do. And so footy was high on the list. Um, so I went down to the first training run and, and uh, Timmy Hackford, who was the club, you know, the president for life, you know, big Tim, um, he said, look, just for your birthday, uh, Hegsy, uh, another guy, Matty Hegarty, it's our birthday uh, this weekend. Here's an invite, come along to this fancy dress party. And I went, oh, okay, it sounds like a pretty good club. So I go along with the fancy dress. It was all 70s gear. You know when you think fancy dress, so, yeah, half people will be dressed up, half won't be. So I didn't get dressed up. I rock up at this joint. The girl opens the, the door of an afro and on roller skates with a plate a tray full of cocktails for me. And everyone is totally dressed out in staff gear and hutch and various other gear. So so um, I thought, straight away, I thought, this is my footy club. <laughs> this is this is <laughs> my home. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I, I 
yeah, like they're great guys. And again, you know, the the, uh, the, 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 the Bintang's Big Day Out is one of the biggest uh, social events on the calendar back in Australia these days, and all the boys get together. Um, love and like brothers, you know, um, we had awesome grand final functions. Uh, you know, the footy club, to me, uh, during that period of all the security issues, because we were getting, you know, bombs were going off all over the joint. And, uh, you know, at times we found we had, we had bomb threat against our house, actually, and had to move out of our house and, and other Bintangs put us up. Um, you know, we had lost a lot of players, as in not die, but people left when the, the embassy got bombed. Um, and those boys stuck together, uh, you know, really, really well. And, and I think it's what brings people together, footy clubs and adversity. Um, one of the best ever footy tours I went on was to Singapore in 2005. And it was with, we only had 12 players because we'd lost a lot of players because of the bombing. Uh, but we still wanted a tour. It was our first tour after the bombing, and the Singapore boys looked after us really well. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a – I brought in – that's when the tequila Tom Billy was all started coming about because I brought in the rule that you weren't allowed to drink 12 hours before the game, and the game wasn't until 4 p.m. 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So so, so I uh, so I, I said to the boys, if we put up a good show, and if we win, I'll buy a bottle of tequila after the game. Well, we didn't win, but – the boys all still wanted the tequila, so <laughs> so that's where it all started. The uh, after every game for the rest of my life as coach at the Bintangs, I had to buy a bottle of tequila. Mate, I spent so much money on tequila for that football club <laughs> every <laughs> single game. <laughs> just before we just before we touch on Asian Chance with Jakarta Bintangs, because a lot of us don't understand the the real history of the start of Asian Champs and in Asian footy, but you did have a banner on your last game of two thousand and seven. It read. Uh, to te tequila Tom Dooley last match on a banner. Yeah. Um, can you touch yeah. on that? And can you also touch on those really early Asian champs history that a lot of us are really unaware and we'd like to sort of reopen the history books on, on that segment of our history of AFL Asia? Mate, you're making me feel real old, you know, about this, don't you? Just <laughs> 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 um, Well, I didn't play the, the first couple because I was in, uh, where was I? I was in China, actually, um, 2001. I, I think the first one, someone I probably should know this, was 2001 or 2000, I can't remember exactly. Um, but Jakarta was very successful the first few years, uh, and then Singapore was successful, Hong Kong. Uh, when I joined the Bintangs in 2004, the champs were in Malaysia, and uh, there was a very strong sense that, you know, we'd won it twice, that we are going to reclaim it. Um, you know, I was, you know, probably I was just turned turned. I think I was 39, so probably my best year. Some would argue my best years were behind me when I reached about 25. But uh, but anyway, I was, I was playing on the half-forward flank, and the first game was against uh, China. And then and the night before, I'd put up with a few of the China boys because I knew them from Shanghai, and, and Big Mick, Mick Mitash and a few of the lads, they were all saying, we're going to knock you guys off in the first game, and don't, you know, Tom, we're going to look out, we're going to come hard at you. And I go, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the very first game of the Champs, 2004, 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm playing half-forward flank, we get an early point. The ball's kicked out. I take a really good mark, and that's the that's the last thing I remember the whole weekend. Because as I took the mark, I came off the pack, and uh, Mick Midash was running around the bottom of the pack, and my head collected with his knee. So I was actually out by the time I hit the deck, and um, I ended up in hospital, and and five plates and twenty screws in my noggin later. So um, I can I've got some really good dad jokes now. You know, I've got screw loose, or you know, uh, if you want to feel my nuts, um, I've got a couple of really good dad jokes these days. <laughs> <laughs> So that was uh, my 2004 champs. Um, 2005, we went to Manila. Um, again, we were struggling because we didn't have a lot of players. And um, a few of the old boys came up from Australia to help out, uh, Neil Thompson particularly, uh, legend of the Binteng. Uh, we did pretty well. We won a few games, um, lost a few games, um, probably performed better off the field than on the field. Uh, we spent a shitload more money on tequila. Uh, you know, and the story goes on. Uh, 2006 was we hosted it. And it was really important for the Bintangs because post the bombing was super keen to get people to tour. Now, a lot of people didn't want to come, and those clubs that did come we were forever indebted because, you know, they they uh, said, no, no, we're going to support you. You know, Shanghai, uh, Shanghai, um, you know, Hong Kong and, and Singapore and Malaysia and and uh, you know, Thailand. Thailand boys actually lost to Thailand in the first game, which under my bad coaching, which pretty much cost us a spot in the grand final. But, but it was a really good event. Um, the only footnote... To it was uh, the guy that was looking after the trophies uh, slept in and forgot to bring him down to the ground. Um, so, so a bit of issues on the logistics. But uh, so that was 2006. And then 2007, when I played my last game, um, I was actually back in Australia. 
I've been posted back to Canberra and I came back especially for the chance um, to, to Thailand and hence the, hence the banner and and I, I still said to Matt Jolly, the only reason he got the banner made is he wanted to make sure I bought the tequila after the game again. So, <laughs> but no, the, the Asian Champs is one of those great, and I went to the last year's one, of course, and it's a shame you can't do it this year, but the way it's grown and the scale and the organisation, all done largely by a bunch of volunteers who just love their footy. I mean, it's, it's, it's hats out to be involved, to be honest. Yeah, it's bloody awesome. Um. We like to uh, we like to throw across to some of the comments that come in from from Facebook, and um, despite all the tequila, you're getting very respectful comments. <laughs> I thought this was an interesting angle that we might even touch on a little bit more oh. later um, from, the, from the Krakatoas. Um, <laughs> is, is this actually a government grant, or or is this no? Uh, this, is, this is a story. <laughs> actually, oh, I, I thought that. I want to know who actually set that one up. It's, I reckon it might be Ian Shearer. Or, 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 yeah, I think you're on the money. I think you're on the okay, money. Okay, so uh, the government grants. Okay, this is – luckily I'm no longer in government because if if, it, if, it, if this became now we're going live to air, I could possibly be kicked out to make service. But So on said uh, 42, 42 at Singapore in 2005, uh, this is the night before the game. I was curfew at 4 a.m. because we go you know, no drinking 12 hours before the game. We actually um, got – kicked out of a couple of bars about midnight and we were circling around uh, Boat Key and a few different places, you know, trying to find somewhere to drink. And we went up to a karaoke uh, place and the boys went to the top floor and I went to the medium floor and there was an empty bar and I kind of rummaging through trying to find some um, some drinks and I found this big two-litre Johnny Walker black in a wooden cradle, you know, those big bottles of, uh, you know, yeah. And I just thought it was a great idea that I'd solve all the problems for the boys that I would just... Uh, I'd, I'd uh, temporarily borrow said bottle of, uh, of Johnny Walker Black. And as I've taken this, the boys have been kicked out of the karaoke. They come downstairs. I'm running down the road with this Johnny Walker Black in a big cradle. And I get around to the corner and Matt Stevens, who's the, the captain, goes, Tommy, what are you doing, mate? Like, and I said, oh, yeah, you know, Singapore. If he's thrown in jail, I said, yeah, I know. So I, I took it back and put it on the valet stand out the front of the, uh, out the, front of the, uh, the karaoke joint and came back and Steve-O gave me a beer. We found some beer in the 7-Eleven right near where we were. We're both having a beer and a guy came down, took it and took it back up again. And Steve-O, it's Steve-O's fault, always blame Steve-O. Steve-O said, it's a shame you took it back. It would have made a great perpetual trophy for the footy club. And I gave him my beer. I went back, went back up there and stole it again. <laughs> <laughs> and by this stage, we're, yeah, we've all gone home. And, and, you know, when you're asleep and you can remember something, but you think, surely I didn't do that. I mean, I was, you know, I was in the embassy. You know? um, and I just... Didn't see it again, thinking that it, it had vanished or maybe, it, you know, who knows what happened to it. Fast forward to that year's presentation night and uh, yeah. there's one trophy left at the end under a cover and uh, whoever won the best and fairest for the Bintangs, had to, the new thing was, had to drink a nip out of the government grant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's called the government grant. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> Well, there we go. I was ready for like, uh, I thought this is how the development happened in Indonesia and there was this whole, um, exactly, anyway, <laughs> um, far more entertaining. Your, ne your next um, destination was, was Guangzhou where you not only founded a, a footy club but a footy league in the southern China yeah. AFL. Yeah. So the Scorpions and the, uh, the South China AFL. How Difficult was that whole process coming into a region with no footy and then not just setting up a club, but then setting up something beyond that club for the club to exist within? Yeah, well, I, I, look, I had grown up a little bit since the days of the uh, Jakarta Big Tans. <laughs> <laughs> this was next, next stop, wasn't it? <laughs> so I was thinking as a uh, Consul General, I mean, it literally started from from two things. One, I very much believe in sports diplomacy and, and in Jakarta yep. a lot of outreach through the uh, the embassy with soccer into the local kampung. So I was thinking as Consul General, how's a way that I can I can uh, more get ourselves actively involved in um, in uh, in the local community, but also marry it with something I'm very passionate about, and that's obviously footy. And um, so and I've been, I, I caught up with Darren Flanagan, uh, Flanners, who was across in Hong Kong at the time. Um, well, I, I can't remember why I was over there. We caught up and had a couple of beers and and uh, and Suchi and, and Don Dunn and all those uh, legends of that footy club. And and the thought was that if, you know, if we can get a club going, we could play against Hong Kong and there was the lightning in Macau. So 
I was at the um, at an Irish pub in Hong in uh, Guangzhou, and I was one of the guys I was working with me at the consulate, Matty Warren, who might be dialed in too. Um, Matt was with the AFP in Guangzhou, and he loved his footy. And we were sitting around having a few beers, watching a game from Australia. It was, I think it was about April in 2010, and we just counted in the bar. There were eight Aussies watching the footy, you know, all shapes and sizes. And I, I just said to the guys at halftime, who, who's keen to start a footy club? And they all went, oh, yeah, why not? So so that's how the, the Scorpions. So we only had eight players, um, but we knew a lot of other people, and uh, we started training. Uh, there was eight of us at the initial training, and then we recruited some Dutchies, a couple of Frenchmen, the, the odd Irish guy. Even the uh, the special service Israeli secret agent for the uh, the Israeli consul general uh, Nimrod, he was a gun halfback flanker. Loved the game, uh, you know. And then all of a sudden we had about twenty five blokes having a kick, um, and then we, so we we then had enough people. The, the, the query was, would we be able to get along to the field? And, um, and that's the reason I chose this shirt uh, because it was actually the shirt we got made for our very first ever game of the Scorpions. Uh, and you can see that on the. Uh, August 2010, and um, so we played this game against the Macau Lightning for the Pearl River Cup, the first game for the club. Um, I'd even gone as far as to make up my own little design. The reason that we're red, yellow, and blue is out of a Carlton man, so the navy blue of the of, of, of the, the Carlton and the red and yellow of China, as someone uh, perfectly matches the crow's colours. So that kind of <laughs> didn't work out like I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so we got the, the jumpers made, and and we played, and we played in Macau, and um, and yeah, you know, I was thinking in case you asked the question, one of my one of my best memories of footy, um, and this is probably it. First first game of the footy club, you know, we're playing in thirty odd degree heat outside of Guangzhou, and it's you know not too bad a ground, but a bit of a scratchy ground against against the Macau boys, and um, and I got my half back line was a, an Israeli, two Dutch guys, my ruckman was a French guy, played basketball. Yeah, we had a Johnny who was the Irishman who could run all day, a young kid. Uh, he was pretty good. Um, I was at full back and Matty Warren's at full forward and, and uh, it was a pretty scr scratchy team. Yeah. But we're hanging in there the whole game. We get to three-quarter time and and I was consul general, but I lost it. You know, I was going red and, you know, I was, you know boys, if you're ever going to win a game of footy, this is the time to win it, you know. And, uh, and poor old Matty Johnson, who was our center forward, one of the Aussie guys, said, oh, Tommy, I've got a slight twinge in me hammy. And I've just totally and utterly... I don't give a shit if you rip that effing bloody, you know, hamstring off the effing bone. You'll get out there and you'll. Yeah. And Matty took took a kick, took a mark, and kicked the goal that that won us the game pretty much, and and wow. pulled his right off the bone. He couldn't walk for about three weeks, but but to win that first game of footy for a club, um, that first club, yeah, you know, you've created and with those guys, and and for me the the the, the idea was to marry the my own desire to play footy, but with this issue around development. So, and I should put aside my own interest here for a second, that the development piece is big because the footy club gave me a, a, a lever, a tool to start talking to the local universities. And that's where the sports university, where we then started getting players from. And I brought Flanners over from um, Hong Kong. We met the, the vice chancellor. We actually got AFL to be accredited as a sport at the university, which then meant we could then get access to grounds and get access to players which meant that all the guys, the Dutchies, and when they left, we just were starting to bring in Chinese guys. And now you look at the Scorpions and it's predominantly, you know, made up of, of Chinese yeah. guys and, and yeah. they're good, you know. And, yeah. and to play against Hong Kong now, um, yeah, it's – it's you get to do a lot of things in your life, but you actually don't realise you're going to touch other people when you're trying to do something that's really for your own selfish needs. But, you know, it's created something which has been, uh, you know, been good for other people as well. And, and then the um, – the scaffold started because once we had the club, we wanted to have regular games. And after we played Hong Kong in Guangzhou in December 2010, Dr. and I were having a beer um, at John's Tavern. And uh, it's pretty much how we then sat down and sketched out what we thought that might look like. And, and uh, Bobby Burns and Dom and Dom Dunn and all these other guys were super keen. It gave Hong Kong the opportunity to play footy regularly. We got to play footy regularly because a lot of the Chinese guys were desperate to play football regularly. Um, and then the scaffold just took off. Yeah. Fairly, uh, fairly timing, timely comment there. Um, now, footy's, like you mentioned, footy's come along in, in leaps and bounds since that time, um, even to the stage where, you know, the AFL has, has shown up on the block. Ha what involvement have you had with the, the Shanghai Games that have been held? Uh, not directly. Um, 
my involvement with AFL has been, and Maddie knows a lot about this, is trying to get them to set up a development fund, um, to, to, which is what we're trying to do with AFL Asia, is how do we get you know, matching funding from the AFL to support uh, the great work that's happening in places like Jakarta and Guangzhou and, and, and literally most places these days understand the need for development. They're all, I, I think it's one of the greatest things I've seen um, with the Asian champs, the development of the, the non, the indigenous side of it, you know, and, and the way that footy is growing in, in everywhere, Vietnam, Thailand, you know, Japan, China. Um, so it was with the AFL or more in that context. So around the International Cup in 2014 um, to try and get the China team out to Australia. Um, and that's where the, the, that's that's where and this is where it's going with the Shanghai game because what we did we reached out to try and raise the money with Flanners and Jamie P and a few of the other guys in Australia. We'll trying to work out where we get the capital to to, to bring it. Meaning about hundred grand. And um, and we I approached Melbourne because I'd helped Melbourne get their sponsorship with China Southern Airlines, mm. also generals. So I thought they might have thrown a bit back my way, but unfortunately they apart from auctioning a couple of football jumpers, we raised who knows how much. Uh, they weren't really yeah. into the party, so. I was able to get Williamstown. I was on the board of Williamstown Footy Club, yep. uh, the VFL club team, to throw in some money. And Williamstown hosted the China team and then sponsored the, hence the, the, the Guangdong Seagulls were the Williamstown jumper in the local league as a result of uh, Williamstown supporting. Okay. But Port Adelaide, the big story here is Port, is Port Adelaide because we, um, Koshi's uh, daughter was living in Hong Kong and um, we were able to make contact with her and then get a proposal in front of Koshi um, about the opportunity for free in Asia, and if Port Adelaide were to sponsor the China team, that they'd be able to come to a, to Australia, spend some time in Port Adelaide. And the, the angle was that there's so many Chinese students, you know, well, w was then, I mean, bit, not now because of coronavirus, right. but there were Chinese students that if you, if you put on a game and get the guys to come down, you pick up these students, then you can actually get a bit of a following going in, uh, in China. That was the idea and sponsorship. So yeah. Port Adelaide, through, through the efforts of Andy Hunter and a bunch of others, have, have uh, Keith Thomas have taken that on board, and that's where the, the genesis for the the, uh, the Shanghai game came from. Incredible, huge, huge. Um, <laughs> it's, like, it's like pulling a thread; you got no idea where it's going to end up. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Better the old how long's piece of string, and and it's obviously that's where I'm probably moving towards now. Duels. How much has footy changed? We, we talked about a lot of the earlier Asian champs and we know that it was expat based and you, and you mentioned you went to the Asian champs, which is probably the first for a long time. What's been the biggest improvement for footy in Asia and where do you think, in an ideal world, put the coronavirus aside, where does footy, what does footy look like five, ten years down the track in Asia? Oh, probably observation from the Asian champs is how much quicker it is. Um, people are generally fitter. I mean, I, you know, the days of doing it, you know, the Tom Dooley training technique of, you know, no drinking 12 hours before the game is pretty much gone, gone out the window, I think. <laughs> we don't rehydrate over cans of Carlsberg anymore. Um, so those things have, have obviously changed. Um, and, and and just the professionalism around clubs. Um, I mean, you know, Ricky Olorenshaw at the Volcanoes and and to see what he's done there with the, the Bali boys and, and just how they've come on and... Um, and just the whole Indonesia. I mean, everyone's had to get their game and take it to another level. I think is the, is the answer for all clubs. Yeah, you know, they want to compete. Um, they want to be you know, successful. So I think that's where we are right now. I, I, the question which I think is probably the more important one is where we're going to be in five years, ten years time. Um, I think I think there's a great future for what we're trying to do on the development side. Uh, we, we now there's we know there's over ten thousand kids, oh, not kids, people playing footy in Asia now. You know the. Someone told me, and I understand it's true, that the biggest uh, crowd watching the grand final outside of Australia was in Shanghai last year. Um, mm. People who get exposure to the game just love it, given the nature of the game, the running, the bouncing, yeah. the speed, you know. And, I, and I, just, I just hope that with the coronavirus we don't end up um, losing sight of that potential. Um, you know, not we, we need to have proper development. We need to support the clubs that are doing it you know, it, it themselves raising their own money and, and putting it towards their own, their own time. I mean, people will do that anyway. But I still think the potential, given the connections between Australia and Asia, the potential for AFL and Asia is, to me, is, is huge, probably better than a lot of other places. Um, so I'm not, I just think that while the AFL, the champs will always be important for people like us, you could quite conceivably see in 10 years' time the team that wins the champs will be a, an all-Chinese team or an all-Indonesian team or, you know, because they've been playing since they're kids and uh, and their skills and they're fitter, so that's that's what makes me excited. When we finally get 
the teams all mixing and playing each other and these local guys become the, the champs and we're the, we're the guys still chasing them. Brilliant summary. And um, we'll put that on the record books there, Bill. Can you cut and paste that for future reference? <laughs> I'm trying to chase big quotes, and I've got a few goosebumps. So thanks very much, Bill, for sharing that. Yeah. Um, we know we've, we're on a bit of borrowed time today. You do have an urgent meeting starting in about 15 minutes' time. So we're going to do a shortened version of our tribal sport friendly fire round. Our tribal sport is our AFL Asia um, a, a preferred apparel provider. Had to spit that out. Thanks to Big David Lake and the team there at Tribal Sport who will look after all of your sporting apparel needs, particularly with the eye on the prize for 2021. Bill, over to you. Can you put out some spot fires for us, please? Yeah, okay. Um, so as quick as quick as we can, can you run through some of the nicknames that you've you've gone through? <laughs> uh, um, well, the, the obvious is Tom, Tequila Tom. Yeah. Uh, was... uh, the Grey Fox. Um, uh, well, for a while I was called Hammies because my Hammies were so bad. It was a bit of play. <laughs> yeah. Cooly Dooly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, geez. Um, so, um, Sputnik, that was uh, when I was a kid. Yeah. And that's what I was, I was always up there and never down here. I, <laughs> I, I had a problem of concentrating when I was a kid. So <laughs> that's why it's called Sputnik. Uh, but yeah, I'll the ones that come to mind. Yeah. That's funny. Um, run us through, aside from the ones you've mentioned, some of the football clubs that you've actually played for, both in Oz and in Asia. Oh, shit. Um, junior footy. Yeah. Uh, then I, Harmon Hogs, um, Crib Point, um, Parramatta in Sydney briefly. Um, hmm. They're all ones in Australia. So the, the Lewin team at, in WA when I played in the, the South Fremantle League. Um, trying to think. Yeah, and then, then, then yeah, the ones in Asia. I think I've, I've played a game for the Wombats, so I can put them on my list, I suppose. Yep. <laughs> Dragons, the Scorpions, uh, the... Uh, the geckos, um, not, not the geckos. I played for the geckos. Played a lot of games against the geckos. Um, the bintangs. Yeah. Uh, played for China. Um, yeah. Jeez, looks like he's frozen, man. Eh? Yeah. Oh, he's back. back. Yeah, did I freeze up, did I? Yeah, as soon as you said China, it was miraculous. Now they're under <laughs> you, Dawson. So you better be careful what you're doing. That old China. Yeah. yeah. Um, so take out any physical, um, capacity issues. What's your favorite position on a footy field? Oh, I used to love being, when I was younger, I used to play a lot of ruck rovey. Yeah, ruck rover half yep. forward. That was, uh, easily my favorite. Yep. yep. And this, this will be a ripper given, um, your, your experience. Um, the best player that you've seen in your, in all of your AFL Asia time. You're allowed to break this into a few people because it is super, super tough to be put on the spot. Yeah, um, that, and I kind of knew you to ask that question. So I, I, if I do break it into when I yeah. was at Dragon, um, you know, we had mate, we had some some of the best footballs we've had the pleasure of playing with, and um, you know, Will, Will Hamilton, Ricky Riddell, uh, Garth McLarty, um, the list goes on. Chrissy Pick. I mean, I, these yeah. names probably don't mean a lot to you guys, but all legends of the uh, the, the Dragons Footy Club. Um, when I was at the the, uh, the Bintangs, uh, Steve and Matt Jolly, um, MJ be on here somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, the little master, you know, he, he uh, you know, two standout players. But probably the best player I played with there was a guy called Chrissy Elliott, uh, ex um, VFA player, um, who we called nicknamed Teabags because he liked to do bungee jumps. Um, but yeah, yeah a little footballer. And then um, probably when I was at the uh, Towards the end, at the um, the Scorpions, you know, my mate Matty Warren was one of their players there, um, and uh, really the guys I played against, you know, Stutchy and you know, was one of the best footballs. Yeah. I've probably the best football I had the pleasure of playing against was probably Gunny, big Gunny Muir, you know, from the Geckos. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, you were you were far too prepared for that question. We normally get. <laughs> We normally catch somebody, they throw one name and they regret it for the rest of their life. All the all the people they burnt. Um, okay, this one, maybe. Uh the the best teammate that you've had the pleasure of playing with. Ooh, gee, that is a good one. Best teammate. The best roommate or best 
<laughs> in what sense? Uh, it, it's, yeah, no, it's teammate. So it's it's whatever yeah. being a part of a team means to you. Oh, uh, look, that's a that's a yeah, that's really I could that's a real hard one. Uh, oh, geez, a bunch of people. Matt, Matty Warren in my days of the Scorpions. Yeah, yeah. way too many good times um, playing footy with him. Geez, uh, of the Bintangs, like it's just yeah, way too many. Yeah, Matt Jolly, Steve O. Uh, John Williams, Cocktails, um, Timmy Hackford, Rob Spur. These are all, I mean, I, I can't really pick. Yeah, they're all just good blokes. Um, yep. The, the Dragons, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping Woody's on here, but, yeah, Ray Ray was uh, was a, a great mate there. And, um, you know, to be honest, all the blokes, <laughs> you know, I, want, I can't yep. um, You don't need to stress, this isn't just live. It actually stays. <laughs> so the people that you haven't mentioned will be able to come through and... Um, Check up on you as well. Um, who would be your most annoying teammate? That should be an easy uh, one. Well, the guy that's put up the cracker tower, uh, yeah. Brent, okay, Ian Shearer. So, so I actually nicknamed him Cracker Tower as coach of the Bintang. So I had the right to nickname every player that came to the club. I brought yep. one of my, in addition to buying tequila. So I nicknamed him Cracker Tower because he just went off like a volcano. I yep. mean, the guy would just go boom, like, you know. Um, so he was pretty annoying. <laughs> Uh, Mark I don't Chapman. know what he's, what he's talking about here with Super Coach 3. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a Bintang in jokes, those ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, now nah, look, um, uh, the guy I played at Harper, uh, the guy I played at Fong Joe, was pretty annoying. Um, uh, days in um, oh, Graham Stillwell. <laughs> days yeah. In Stillers, yeah. yeah. Probably three come to mind. Annoying like, in a I'm not saying annoying in a bad way, annoying in a good way. Yeah. That's right. Um, given our time constraints, um, I'm going to jump right ahead to some some of the more cutting questions. Uh, what would be three things people wouldn't know about you? Oh, uh, oh okay. Um, I'm an astronomer. I spend I spend nights on my balcony watching the stars. Uh, I've got a big telescope. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, what else? Oh, I studied Song Dynasty poetry when I was at university. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, wouldn't know about me. Uh, the, the Navy uh, from 16 qualified for me 40 minutes yeah. ago. Pop, most people know. Um, uh, some people possibly don't know. I also speak the hustle of the region as well. Yeah, okay. These days. Yep. Um, if you could invite any four people to a dinner party, who would they be? Scott Johansson, Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, sorry, my wife might see this, might she? Okay, um, I, I'll, I'll try and lift it up a bit here. Uh, uh, Chris Judd, I wouldn't mind actually having Chris Judd today uh, at, at my dinner. And uh, I need some of them, you know, and Anthony Pete Garrett, some of them, you know, some of the music. Um, your best ever footy trip. Second last question. I, I still reckon the uh, the twenty two thousand and five Singapore trip, where the government grant was born, and uh, and the tequila legend, and uh, all the various other things. Uh, there's another guy, Andrew Lobb, who uh, who was on that trip, who who, who drank the, the, the flaming tower twice. Of, of, I mean, you, if you want to be, you, you, to do it once, and he did it twice. I mean, we had some really Hardcore serious drinkers on that team in those days. <laughs> wow. Um, and what do you what do you like most about Asian footy or playing footy in Asia? Uh, look, you know what I like to, about Asian footy the most, um, and, and playing footy in Asia is is the fans. Uh, you know, I've made so many friends through football in Asia, and when I'm back in uh, in Australia, you know, whether it's the, the Hong Kong Dragons get together or the Bintang Big Day out. Uh, or going to the Shanghai game and, bunch, and running into Jung Ho and the guys from the Guangzhou Gong, Scorpions and, you know, La Wai, La Wai, you know, so, you know it's just, um, it's given me so much in that sense, you know, uh, meeting people like yourselves. Um, it's just been a big family for me and whether I'm in Singapore, I go down to, uh, you know, down to the Wombats functions here and they always make to come up and say good day. Uh, you know, it's just that, that, Sense of community is what I love about. Oh, the other thing too is that prolonged my free career by about thirty-five years. <laughs> That's 
True. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of the time, Matty, and I know that you did have a couple more areas that we might touch on. So I'll cut the tribal sport friendly fire to there and um, leave it back to you. Yeah, very good, Bill. Just just one last parting comment. Um, mindfully, you've got a meeting starting very, very shortly, very imminent. Um, your footprint on, on footy in Asia is absolutely outstanding. You've got an impeccable memory um, for detail. And uh, I was very, I'm very, I think AFL Asia is very fortunate that we were able to headhunt you as part of our inaugural AFL Asia advisory board. Um, and a lot of people who are viewing this podcast now or in the future will probably be unaware of the amount of impact that you've had on developing football within Asia um, from an expat, but more for a local development moving forward and, and to see what's been achieved from your involvement in the game is absolutely outstanding. We're really grateful for, for your contributions over a very long period of time and, and to see you back involved in the game in an administrative role um, is absolutely outstanding. We'd like to utilise your skills moving forward um, in the future when, when footy's back up and running in Asia and, um, and and seeing that come to fruition. So thanks very much for joining us today, Bills. No, mate, look, I, I, like I said, I, it's given me so much, I'm just giving back a little bit in return. So, um, and to see people like yourselves and what you're doing and um, being back involved and to see how many people want to take it forward. Yeah, how, how good is footy in Asia? I mean, it's <laughs> never been a better word, is, is there? I mean, it's a great slogan. So, uh, so look, thanks for the chance to to bore you guys with, with a few more of my old stories. I've got this, I've heard these before, but... Um, Look, um, and hopefully we can all catch, a, catch up again sometime for a beer soon. That'd be fantastic. Um, thanks very much, Dawes. Thanks, Bill. You've been on fire today on your friendly fire hour. <laughs> but uh, Dawes has been an outstanding guest, and thanks very much for joining us. We look forward to our next guest uh, next week, which is Caro, which is going to be an absolute juggernaut. So stay tuned. We'll join you again next week. Bye for now. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thanks.